Hi. Today I'm going to talk about the conservation of waterlogged wood. In my archaeological career, I've had the privilege to work on a few sites with waterlogged timber, and as a student, I studied wooden artifacts that we had excavated from an 1820s mill, where they're being conserved in the conservation lab. Many of these techniques can and have been applied to other organic materials, but for the purpose of this video, I'll focus on wood. Anaerobic conditions in waterlogged archaeological sites can prevent the deterioration of organic materials like wood for hundreds or even thousands of years. But when archaeologists remove these artifacts from their anaerobic conditions, a race is on to conserve them before they dry out and crumble to pieces. The wood removed from these conditions may seem okay to the naked eye, but on a cellular level, that's not the case. Bacteria causes the degeneration of the cell walls, and water-soluble substances within the wood, such as starch and sugar, leach out of it. Over time, a process called hydrolysis, which is a chemical reaction where water breaks down the molecular bonds, disintegrates the cellulose in the cell walls, leaving behind a network of lignin, which is the organic polymer that lends wood its strength, that itself will break down over time. This causes the space between the cells to grow, making the wood more porous and permeable, and all of these spaces will fill with water. The remaining lignin structure filled with water retains the shape of the original wood as long as it's kept wet. If the wood's exposed to air and dried, the weakened cell walls collapse and the wood shrinks considerably, distorting, cracking and delaminating, resembling highly accelerated dry rot. I've got a piece of waterlogged timber here that's been allowed to dry out without conservation. And you can see here on the surface how cracked and damaged it has become, just delaminating and flaking off. There. And you can see that only the solid heartwood has remained. This was a much larger piece of timber when it was first collected. Certain principles govern conservators and form a code of ethics. 1. The integrity of the object should be respected. After conservation, an object should retain as many of its diagnostic aspects as possible. 2. A conservator should only take on projects within their competence and facilities. 3. There's a single standard, a constant level of care and treatment that should be applied to objects irrespective of the value of the object. 4. Suitability of the treatment. Each object should be treated using methodologies in the best interest of the object. And five, reversibility. Treatments that cannot be reversed in the future if need be should not be used. Now this principle is interesting. As common techniques previously thought as highly reversible, such as PEG, polyethylene glycol, are proving to not quite be as reversible as first thought, but are still heavily used. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the preservation of valuable wooden artifacts was done using oils, varnishes, resins, glues, and natural wax. Creosote was frequently used to sterilize the wood to discourage pests. Waterlogged timber lacked the fundamental strengths of normal timber due to the cellular degeneration. And frequently these methods did not work as they would on sand timber. A Danish restorer, C.F. Herbst, developed a technique of replacing the water in the timber with alum. And between 1858 and 1958, 100,000 objects were conserved in this way at the Denmark National Museum. In 1904, a method of conserving wood using sugar was patented. And while not a success, it did lead to further interest in the use of sugar in timber conservation. In the 1930s, research began at the United States Forest Products Laboratory in Madison to develop methods to prevent shrinkage of waterlogged wood. One technique to come out of this research was polyethylene glycol treatment, which was then famously used on the Vasa and the Mary Rose, and has become the most common treatment for waterlogged archaeological timber. Polyethylene glycol is a synthetic wax. At low molecular weights, referred to as pegs 300 to 600, it's a liquid, Pegs 1,000 to 1,500 are gels, a bit like petroleum jelly. And at higher molecular weights, it's a solid wax. 
Unlike true waxes, PEG is soluble in both alcohol and water. The PEG conservation process involves submerging the cleaned object in water, a biocide, and a low percentage of PEG solution. Sometimes the tank is heated to improve penetration of the PEG into the timber. Over time, the percentage of PEG to water is increased, and the wax slowly permeates the wood, filling the cellular cavities in the decayed timber, displacing the water. At the end of the operation, the object is coated with a 70 to 100% molten PEG, and the excess wax removed from the surface. This process can take months or even years, depending on the size and condition of the timber involved. Alcohol can be used instead of water, which accelerates the treatment and means no biocide is needed, however this makes the treatment more expensive. PEG is a proven excellent preserver of waterlogged timber, but it has its downsides as well. Since it's filling the cellular cavities of the wood with wax, it makes the treated timber heavier than normal dry timber. It can also darken it considerably. It also doesn't play well with metal, as it's corrosive, so it creates problems for any timber with metal fittings in, such as nails. The resulting chemicals released can then further damage the wood around it. Archaeological wood sometimes contains unstable sulphides, which will oxidize to sulfates, which then will eventually become sulfuric acid. Sulfide-rich wood is sometimes treated with ammonia to stabilize it. In addition, by saturating the wood with wax, it means that the wood will become vulnerable to conditions that would harm the wax, such as extremities of humidity and heat. Alternatives to PEG do exist. Though I've never personally seen them used, it would be remiss of me not to mention them. The fundamental principles of shoving something stable into those cellular cavities to stop them collapsing remains. Sugar continues to be used by some as a cheap alternative to PEG, and the methodology is very similar to PEG, requiring a biocide, starting with a low concentration of sugar, building it up over time. An additive to make the finished timber less delicious to pests is often used, as you're essentially turning a lump of wood into a lollipop. Or maybe a piece of crystallized ginger is a better analogy. It's the cheapest option, and the trade-off for this is a definite color change, and often the surface of the timber will be covered in small hairline cracks. The treated timber is also vulnerable to humidity, which will leach out the sugar the same way high humidity leaches out peg. The acetone rosin method was developed to conserve well-preserved hardwoods, which are impervious to the higher molecular weight pegs. The object is bathed for days in acetone, removing all the water in the cells, then placed in a sealed container with a solution of pine rosin, dissolved in acetone, and the rosin fills the timber cells in the same way peg or sugar does. The resulting timber is much more like real wood than peg treated timber. It's light, dry, strong, and can be easily glued and repaired. It also has no effect on metal objects in the wood, making a good option for composite metal wood artifacts. The downside is that acetone is highly flammable, and all the materials needed for it makes this a very expensive method. Similar methods exist using alcohol and ether instead of acetone, and camphor instead of rosin. Freeze drying is an option for small objects. The wood is pre-treated in peg and biocide, and then the object freeze dried, a process that continues until the water is removed from the object through sublimation. This is by far the most expensive option on this list. The final method I'll mention is silicone oil treatment, where the oil is bathed first in ethanol, then acetone under a vacuum, then SFD1 silicone oil, and uh, this is added, and a mixture held in vacuum overnight. The wood is then removed, patted dry, placed in a container with a catalyst in it, then baked at 52 degrees Celsius, which vaporizes the catalyst, curing the silicon oil into the wood. The resulting timber retains its natural color and requires no environmental controls. However, the process is definitely not reversible. 
Now I'll show examples of some timber that's being conserved. I've shot myself in the foot a bit already by using the Mary Rose and Vassa in my maritime archaeology video, but um, I think I have plenty of options available. The Corley Bog Trackway was built around 147 BC in County Longford, Ireland, and traversed the peat bog for at least a kilometre for unknown reasons, either to safely get through the bog or to access the bog to take advantage of its resources. It eventually sunk under its own weight and was preserved in the anaerobic peat until its discovery in 1984. An 18 metre long section of the Oak Trackway has been conserved and is on display for the public and a modern boardwalk lies on top of the 80 metre section of buried trackway. The Sea of Galilee boat, also known as the Jesus boat, dates to the 1st century AD and was discovered in the Sea of Galilee in Israel in 1986. This 8 metre long fishing boat was very fragile and underwent 10 years of peg conservation before going on display. The Osberg ship is a very impressive 21 metre long Viking ship dating to around 834 AD. It was excavated from a burial mound in 1904. Upon removal, the ship itself was coated in linseed oil and creosote, and the smaller wooden artefacts found within were conserved using the alum method. These early conservation methods are causing quite a few problems for modern conservators, and creating issues for their long-term survival. Many artefacts now are very fragile, pretty much held together just with layers of lacquer. A number of attempts have been made to copy the Osberg ship, and the early replicas suffered from an error that was made when piecing back together the ship for display. The replica completed in 2012 took this error into account and ventured into the open sea in 2014, performing really well. Now I'll show you some examples from here in New Zealand. The Kaitaia lintel is one of New Zealand's oldest carvings. It was discovered in 1920 when Lake Tangonge, I hope I pronounced that right, I seriously doubt it though, was drained. It dates between the 14th and 16th centuries. It's believed to be the length of a gate rather than a doorway, as it's carved on both sides. This 17th century carved canoe prow was found in Mason Bay on Stewart Island, and conserved using peg. While some of the fragile fretwork is gone, it remains an impressive artifact, an example of Maori carving. This section of a large double-hulled canoe was discovered in Anaweka, at the top of the South Island, as being preserved at Peg at the time of this video production. It dates to the 14th century, it's made of New Zealand timber, and has a distinct sea turtle carving, a feature absent in Maori art, but very common in the Pacific. It provides a fascinating link between the Māori of New Zealand and the wider Polynesian culture of the Pacific. One key factor in wooden artefact conservation I have not gotten into much yet is the cost. Conservation of artefacts is something done by highly trained conservators and takes large amounts of time, requires considerable space and facilities for large objects, and lots of materials such as chemicals. When there's not the funding to pay for the conservation of a discovered artifact, an archaeologist may have little choice but to rebury it and hope that the ground conditions will continue to preserve it. Or if this isn't an option, the artifacts may just dry out and be destroyed. I've seen this happen to many artifacts in my career and it can be heartbreaking. The conservation of wooden and organic artifacts is important to archaeologists, as unlike many artifacts we recover, they can degrade and fall apart in front of our eyes without proper care and conservation. Thanks for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers!